Welcome to section three of our course. Here we're going to look at data communications. Now in the past you took a look at telephone systems and equipment and how they're used to communicate with voices. Now we're going to look at computers and terminals and how they communicate using the telephone network. Since this is an introductory course, all we're going to look at is basic modems and how they operate and how the computers and the terminals communicate with each other over those modems and the communications networks. The easiest place to start with data communications is to look at a simple terminal like this one which is what we call a TTY type terminal in that the terminal has no intelligence and everything that it does and displays is handled by the computer system. The terminal here communicates in a digital manner and uses a device here called a modem which is an acronym for modulator demodulator which we'll explain a little later. But the purpose of the modem is to take the terminal's output and make it into something that a telephone line can handle and move cross country or even just across your local city. Let's take a look at a diagram and see how all this fits together. This drawing's in your textbook and you may want to follow along because some of the lettering is small. Our terminal here is what we call a TTY terminal which is short for teletype terminal in that it emulates the way a teletype machine works. As each character is typed on the keyboard, the character moves down to the computer and is what we call echoed back and displayed. In this way, everything you type and you see on the screen is the same as what the computer saw. So that if the wrong character is displayed, you know you can backspace and re-enter the correct character. The formatting of the data on the screen is determined by the computer. The important thing here though for this first part is to recognize that the data coming out of the terminal is in what we call a digital format. It must be converted into a format the telephone line recognizes and that's done with what we call a modem. The modem takes the digital output, converts it into telephone line type signals, and at the opposite end, another modem converts it back into digital format. If we were to take and capture one character coming out of the terminal, this is what it would look like, a series of positive and negative voltages moving across in time, dependent on which portion of the character is positive and negative. This determines the data bits that make up the character. Now we're using the ASCII code or American Standard Code for Information Interchange. And in the ASCII code, this would represent the character A as it was seen on the line. Later we'll describe this in detail in protocols, but remember that what we're seeing is a series of voltages or ons and offs or like in the old telegraph, the marks and spaces moving across the line. We can't transmit this kind of information over a regular telephone line. Now looking at our chart showing the data source and the sync, and remember we talked about information flow earlier in the course where you had the source which initiated the information and the sync which received or absorbed it. They're going to be communicating in these marks and spaces or plus and minus voltages. In the middle here will be the modems as shown by this drawing. Here we've inserted modems into the information flow between the source and the sink. The modem's purpose is to convert the information into a signal form that the telephone network can understand. This is important. Remember that the only purpose of the modem is to convert the signal to allow it to move over long distances. As far as the information passing through the modem, the modem doesn't care. It's strictly an electronic interface or connection between the two types of information. There are multiple steps to this process of data communications. In the first step, the operator sitting at the terminal is actually communicating with a computer application program. That's one form of communications at a high level. In the next step down, the terminal here is communicating with the computer which is coming back and formatting the screen or acknowledging as we call it the data saying I got the data okay send me more data things like that and then finally way down at a low level 
the actual physical communications is taking place where the bits or the marks and spaces coming out of the terminal are being converted into a different type of electrical signal moved over a telephone line and are converted back into the digital or marks and spaces and given to the computer. What we're going to do is we're going to look first at that modem and its electrical conversion. Now we just took a look at three charts that showed you the two devices communicate in digital but the telephone line requires something different so the modem performs that conversion for the telephone line. In reality you will always have a modem even if you're not running over telephone circuits if you're running into a modern digital network you'll have a device called a DSU which is still a modem it just has a different acronym to name it in our course we're only going to be concerned with the simple modems that interface with telephone circuits and we're going to cover that in the first part of section three and in the second part of section three we'll tell you what this terminal is saying when it talks to the computer in order to make use of the telephone line the modem is going to have to convert the digital signals into something that the telephone line can carry this is our frequency response chart from the telephone line that we looked at in section two here we've idealized it so that we've squared what we call the envelope which covers all of the frequencies the phone line will carry and more or less took all the bumps out of the curve here all we're interested in is what frequencies fit within this envelope or curve the modem will have to somehow take the digital signals and convert them into frequencies or tones that will fit within this envelope. Our modem is now going to take the digital output from the computer and put it on the telephone line and fit it into that envelope of frequencies. In other words, what this thing has to do now is take these digital signals from me typing on the keyboard and convert it into something that approximates the human voice. Now, we're lucky in one way because we're dealing with digital information which only comes in marks and spaces. So what we need to do is somehow convert mark and space into something on the telephone line. And the way we're going to do it is we will use two different tones or two different frequencies, one to represent mark and one to represent space. But what we need is something like the telegraph key or the telephone mouthpiece which is going to put that on the line and we do that with what's called a transmitter or a modulator. In this diagram we have our transmitter which we also call the modulator the two names being interchangeable. The transmitter takes the ones and zeros in digital format or marks and spaces or plus and minus voltages whatever you're using and converts it into two frequencies on the output. And the two frequencies we're going to use in this particular type of modulator or transmitter are for a space which is equivalent to a binary zero we will use 2200 hertz. For a mark which is equivalent to a binary one we will use 1200 hertz. So that the two digital states coming in of mark and space or one and zero cause the transmitter to shift frequency. We call this frequency shift keying. And you notice the similarity between the word transmitter and keying in our old telegraph system, which keying means the signal coming in affects the output of the transmitter. At the remote end of the telephone line, the tones come into a device called the receiver or demodulator. As the different tones come in, the receiver or demodulator converts them back into the plus and minus voltages, marks and space, or ones and zeros. For instance, an incoming 1200 hertz tone will give a binary one or a mark out. An incoming 2200 hertz tone will give a zero or a space out. In the unit we just looked at, we saw we had a modulator which actually took and translated the data into something the telephone line understood. And for the incoming signal, we converted it back into digital with a demodulator here. We combine these units into our modem. 
Now the modem hooks to a telephone line here. The telephone line, the standard for how they operate, is set by either the FCC in the United States or the CCITT outside the United States. On this side, we have to have some way of connecting our terminal or computer up that is a standard so that electrically a mark or a space will always be the same depending on what type of computer or terminal you have. Otherwise, the modem wouldn't work correctly. We also need signals to control the modem, to turn it on and off, and things like this. So there has to be a standard here for how you connect to the modem. This is set in the United States by the Electronic Industries Association, or the EIA. In outside the United States, it's set by the CCITT. The modem itself, what frequencies it uses, and how it modulates the signal depends on the speed you want to transmit at and the manufacturer of the modem. There are standards for modems for different speeds, but in general, they vary according to how you're going to use the modem, the speed, whether it's dial-up or private line service. Here we're going to look first at the interface, or how you connect to this modem. Then we'll look at some different types of modems and how they operate. Here's the modem we use with our terminal here in our demonstrations. Now, in order to make sure that this terminal can connect to this modem, there's a standard. And in the United States, we call it the EIA RS-232 standard, EIA being Electronic Industries Association, and RS-232 being the number of the standard. One of the things the standard decides is on the back of the modem, must be a female 25-pin connector. The cable from our terminal or computer is the male connector, which will then mate into the back of the modem and complete the connection. Over the 25 pins, various signals control the modem and tell the terminal what the state of the modem is. We want to take a look now at what all those signals are and how they function. Our interface between the terminal or computer and the modem falls under this RS-232 standard in the United States. Elsewhere in the world, it falls under what's called CCITT V.24. Now, the V.24 and the RS-232 standards are identical now. All they determine is that the back of the modem gets the female connector, and that coming from the computer, or terminal is the male connector. At the computer end, they do not care whether the cable is wired or soldered in or whether it's a male or a female connector. All they care about is this connection. In addition, the signals going back and forth, the voltages of those signals and what pins they're on are set down by this standard. What we'll do is we'll take the modem and we'll break it into the blocks first, show you the simple signals combine it into a complete modem, show you some more of the signals, and then finally we'll cover the entire RS-232 interface so you can see what all the signals do. Here's our basic transmitter block again, or modulator. The modulator has certain EIA signals which go into and out of it. The first one is transmitted data. This is your actual marks and spaces. They come in on pin 2. Now the transmitter will convert the marks and spaces into tones or frequencies on the line only if it's turned on. We turn the transmitter on by putting an on signal on pin 4 which is called request to send. This is similar to pressing the button on a citizen's band radio microphone where you press the button to turn on the transmitter and when the transmitter is ready it will give you back a signal clear to send which is similar to seeing the red light come on on your citizen's band transmitter. So what we see here is three EIA signals. One is a data signal, and the other two are control signals. Looking at our demodulator or receiver, the signals you'll see are, as the tones or frequencies come down the telephone line, the receiver will convert them back into data, or receive data as we call it, on pin three of the interface. Now, the information coming across the telephone line is in voice frequencies. 
we have to have some way to tell if there's actual data coming down the line. And we do this with a control signal called receive line signal detected or carrier detected in some modems. What this does is when this signal is on going to the terminal or computer it says this is legitimate data here on pin 3. If this pin 8 is not on it says that whatever's coming out on pin 3 is noise or garbage from the line and you ignore it. Something else to notice here we've put the words DCE or data communications equipment above the modem. In the EIA standard they're going to always refer to the modem as the DCE or data communications equipment. They'll refer to the terminal or computer as DTE or data terminal equipment. This will become important when we look at the full chart and see the way signals flow. In our interface to the modem we're looking at the EIA RS-232 or the CCITT V24 interface. The digital signals that come across the interface are in positive and negative voltages. Now, if the signal coming across is data, such as transmitted data going to the modem or received data coming back to the terminal or computer, a plus is a binary zero or a space. A minus is a binary one or a mark. If, however, you're looking at a control signal such as request to send, a plus would be on, in other words, turn on request to send, and a minus would be off, turn off request to send. Now, this is true for the RS-232 and the V24 interfaces. In other interfaces, such as one called the MIL standard 188, which you'll see very rarely, the mark and space voltages may be reversed. So remember that this standard holds true only for RS-232 and V24. Looking at a basic modem now, our modulator or transmitter has the signal request to send with the corresponding return signal clear to send. To turn the modulator or transmitter on, then I would put a plus voltage on request to send. To turn it off, I'd put a negative voltage on. The modulator or transmitter, when it's powered up, will give a plus voltage on clear to send to say, yes, I'm on, or a negative voltage to say, no, I'm off. And our transmitted data would be plus and minus voltages corresponding to the binary zeros and ones, or marks and spaces. Some of the other signals you'll see, of course, are signal detect, which tells you you're receiving a legitimate signal from the line, and it'll be in an on condition for a legitimate signal. Receive data, which will be pluses and minus for the marks and spaces. And down here, some specialized signals, such as if this is a dial line and a call comes in, the phone's going to ring. Now, on a regular telephone, you hear the ringing and pick it up. Since we're working with a computer, the computer gets a positive voltage here to tell it when the incoming line is ringing on a signal called ring indicator. When the computer is ready and powered up, it will put a positive voltage on a pin called terminal ready or data terminal ready to tell the modem that the computer is ready to answer the phone. When the phone goes off hook over here and is answered, the modem will respond with a signal called data set ready. So these signals down here control the physical characteristics of the modem. Are we on hook or off hook? Do we want to go on or off hook? And they're displayed here, and the modulator and the demodulator have their own signals. Now, all in all, there's almost 23 different signals available on the EIA interface, and we're going to take a look at those in more detail. This drawing is in your textbook, and you can follow along as we go over some of the EIA signals. Now, we're not going to do all 25 of the pins. We'll just point out some key ones, and you can go back in your textbook, and there's an explanation of all 25 signals. First, we've given you a column here for the EIA designations for the signals. The Electronic Industries Association uses a multiple letter designation for each signal. The CCITT uses a numbering designation. 
The first column here designates which pin the signal is on. Now, in looking at these, we can see that pin 1 is what's called frame ground. It's an electrical ground for the outside of the modem. Pin 2 is transmitted data, and pin 3 is received data. Looking at the EIA designation, we see that the ground begins with an A, and the transmit and receive data begin with a B. That's for binary. It means these are data signals, and they're the ones that will be negative for 1 and positive for 0. Request to send and clear to send are on pins 4 and 5, and they are CA and CB. The first letter is a C, indicating that they're a control signal, which means a plus is on and a negative is off. On this side of the drawing, we've given you a chart which shows you where it goes from and where it goes to. A from DCE signal would be one that goes from the modem to the DTE or terminal. A to from signal would be one that goes from the terminal back to the modem. If we look, request to send is one that we give to the modem, and clear to send comes back from the modem. There are some signals which are labeled S. Those are secondary channel. In certain types of modems, there are two modulators and two demodulators, and the S are the secondary modulators and demodulators. There are also some signals that begin with a D. Those are clocking signals, which we'll talk about later when we look at certain types of transmission that require special signals to clock the speed of the transmission. This concludes our little discussion of the RS-232 or V24 standard. What I want to make sure you understand is, although this thing is a standard, it's a proposed standard in that you don't have to use all of the pins. You only have to use those ones that are required for your particular piece of equipment. So manufacturers will select subsets dependent on what speed they want to transmit at, whether they need clocking, whether they need to turn the transmitter on and off, or whether it's on all the time. Now, within that, there's a problem because it means that every time you hook up a different piece of equipment to a modem, you have to know what pins are required in the cable between your terminal and the modem or the computer and your modem. Usually the manufacturers will tell this in their documentation. In this particular case, our terminal here only requires the pins 2 through 8 and 20 on the interface. And finally, if we take a look at the cable, we can see that not all the pins are here. Returning now to the output of the modem, when we look at the signal on the telephone line, we see a sine wave like this. If you remember, we looked at a sine wave in section 2 of our course as it was related to information transmitted over a telephone line. Here, we have just a pure sine wave. Now, by changing the frequency of the sine wave or the size or other parameters, we can transmit information down the line. Here's an example of how we can change the sine wave or the signal going down the line to transmit information. First, this is a high frequency and this is a low frequency. As told by the distance between the peaks here is less than it is here. By changing the frequency or what we call frequency modulation, we can tell the difference between a mark and a space. In this case, this signal has less strength or a lower amplitude. By changing the height or strength of the signal, called amplitude modulation, we could also send marks and spaces down the line. We're going to take a look at a simple modem here. It's a Western Electric 202 type modem. It's designed for transmitting 1200 bits per second over a standard telephone line. What we want to do is look at this one because it's one of the simplest modems in the way it modulates the signal and transmits data down the line. So what we want to do first is look at this modem and see how the frequencies lay into the standard envelope of a telephone circuit. Looking at our standard frequency distribution for the telephone line, we block out two frequencies, 1200 and 2200 hertz. 1200 hertz will be used for sending marks down the line, 
and 2200 hertz will be used for sending spaces down the line. The 202 modem will frequency shift between these two as it's keyed by the incoming marks and spaces. We've taken a frequency shift keyed modem apart on the bench here and hooked it up to an oscilloscope so that you can see the output of the modem as it's modulated. Presently, we're modulating the input of the modem with a spacing condition. And the spacing condition is causing the modem to output a sine wave of 2200 cycles per second or 2200 hertz. What we can do is we can take and change the input and you can watch the output of the modem change to 1200 hertz with a marking condition. Looking at our oscilloscope now, we can see on the lower portion of the scope the 2200 hertz sine wave. If we were to tap into the line, we would hear a sound like this. Now the upper part of the scope is showing the EIA or the electrical interface to the modem. If we take and change the electrical interface to a high voltage, the output of the modem changes to the low tone of 1200 hertz. Now the line is in a marking condition. Finally in our lab, let's take a look at a data character going down the line and showing underneath it the shifts of the frequency coming out of the modem. And The way we do that is display it here and using our terminal input a data character into the modem and then look at the frequency shifts coming out down here and you'll see that when the line is down low we got the high frequencies and when it's up high we got the low frequencies. And as you can hear on the line it doesn't sound like good clean frequencies. In our modem on the bench you saw that as we transmitted binary ones the frequency was 1200 hertz. As we transmitted binary zeros, the frequency shifted up to 2200 hertz. If you were to look at a string of ones and zeros on the line, this is what you would see as the modem shifted back and forth in frequency. The 202 type of modem has some limitations in that it only goes up to 1200 bits per second. Now the reason for the limitations are the frequencies used. In any modem that uses frequency shift keying, the lowest frequency has to be at least the same as the bit rate. So a 1200 bit per second modem can only use a low end frequency of 1200 hertz or higher. If we wanted to boost this modem up to operate at 2400 bits per second, we would have to move this signal up to here. Now in addition, the separation between the two signals is determined by the bit rate. The higher the speed, the further apart the signals must be. So if we were at 2400 hertz for our low signal and sending 2400 bits per second, we would need a frequency that's outside the envelope of the telephone line. So there's got to be other ways to get around this problem. Now, the 202 modem, because it uses these two frequencies and it shifts through this range, it can only transmit in one direction at a time. Now why is this a problem? If we're using a half duplex telephone circuit such as this, where both ends transmit and receive over the same pair of wires, when this transmitter is on in this 202, this one has to be turned off. When this one's on, this one has to be turned off. Since they both use the same frequencies for mark and space, the data would be confused if they were both on at the same time. Now we can get around this problem by going to a full duplex circuit where one transmitter works over one pair and one transmitter works over the other pair. Now this is okay if it's a private line circuit. But dial-up circuits are generally arranged in the two-wire or half-duplex type arrangement. So we need a way to transmit data full duplex and yet only use one pair of wires. One way to allow full duplex or simultaneous transmission in both directions at the same time with a frequency shift keyed modem is to split the spectrum 
and then use two frequencies at the lower end for mark and space in one direction, and two frequencies at the upper end for mark and space in the opposite direction. One modem uses this pair of frequencies, the other modem uses this pair. This particular spectrum is for a Western Electric 103 type modem, which transmits 300 bits per second in a full duplex manner over a two-wire line. The frequency shift keying method of transmission in modems really is used for low speeds. And as you can see, because of the need to either increase the frequency for higher speeds or spread them further apart, we run out of spectrum or available bandwidth in the telephone line. So we've got to have another way of taking and impressing information on the phone line, and yet not exceeding those bandwidth characteristics. Now what we can do is, if we look at that sine wave that goes down the line, instead of changing the frequency or the size or amplitude, what we can do is we can twist or distort the sine wave and through the distortion send information. If we look at a sine wave going down the telephone line and save it, we can then take that sine wave and compare it against the ones that come after it. If the peaks and the valleys occur in the same time relationship, then we say that the two sine waves are in phase. If we compare the sine waves and find out that the peaks and valleys do not correspond, now we say that they are out of phase. We can use this in phase and out of phase condition to transmit information. The method of changing the phase or the shape of the signal is called phase shift keying. Now in phase shift keying, there's some difficulties you have to overcome. For one thing, in frequency shift keying, we looked at the sine wave and measured the frequency. In phase shift keying, as I move down the signal, I have to remember what happened in the shift before. So here we take this sine wave and we save it to compare against this one. Then we take this one and compare it against this one and this one against that one, and so on down the line. This means that the modem now becomes more complex. And what you'll see is, when you move from frequency shift keying to phase shift keying, the cost and complexity of the modem goes up. But we get a substantial increase in speed when we go to phase shift keying. For instance, the 201 type modem that we're going to look at goes up to 2400 bits per second. In the case of the 201 modem, they break the phase shifts up into four different types. Now phase is measured in degrees like a circle. So if there is no phase shift, zero degrees, between this and the last sine wave, we call that zero, zero. If there's a 90 degree shift, we call it zero, one. If there's a 180 degree phase shift, we call it 1, 0. And a 270 degree phase shift, 1, 1. In the phase shifting we just looked at, we had four different states. Each one was 90 degrees apart from the other. Now, because we have four states, we can transmit two data bits at the same time. Because if you look at a mark and a space data bit, if you have two of them, there's only four possible combinations you can have. This means that each phase shift on the line accounts for two bits of information. Therefore, 1,200 phase shifts transmits 2,400 bits of information. And what we really say is the signaling rate of the line on this modem is 1,200 baud but the data rate is 2400 bits per second. What we've done now is we've fooled the line. Because the telephone line has certain limitations, we get around it by only sending 1200 shifts or information patterns in a second, but we're actually sending 2400 bits of information. Here in the lab, we've taken a NEC 4800 bit per second modem and tied it to our oscilloscope and we've set the NEC up so it's outputting a series of marks and spaces or ones and zeros. Now the NEC is a phase modulated modem. 
Here on the screen, we have the phase modulated signal going out. Now you'll notice instead of the smooth sine waves that you normally see on the line, you will see at the end of certain cycles, it will shift like going from the peak of one to the peak of another. So looking closely at the screen now, you can see this phase modulated signal going out from the neck modem. In our modem in the lab, the individual phase shifts occur too frequently to be seen well. If, however, we were to transmit this bit pattern down the line, this is the way the signal would look on the line. The 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0 would shift 180 degrees, and then the 1, 1 would shift to 270 degrees. Another way to look at the modulation scheme of the 201 modem is through the use of what we call an eye pattern. On this, we draw a circle, and using arrows, we mark the points at which the phase shifts occur. In this particular case, we have four phase shifts 90 degrees apart. Now, you can look at this and say that by adding more phase shifts, theoretically, we could transmit more information. In this particular case, now we've taken and made a modem that has eight phase shifts, each occurring 45 degrees apart. Now we can send three bits of information at a time, and if we do it at a 1600 baud rate, we'll get a modem that'll transmit 4800 bits per second. The problem is, as we increase the number of phase shifts, we run into a telephone line problem called phase jitter. As an example, the 45 degree angle phase may be moving back and forth with the jitter. As it's moving, the 90 degree angle phase also is moving, and they may cross. At this point here, you would not be able to tell whether the phase shift was supposed to be a 90 or a 45 degree one. So phase jitter sets the upper limit for the number of phases we can shift. However, there's a method to get around phase jitter. In this eye pattern, we've shown four of the phase shifts with a shorter arrow. This indicates that the signal is sent at a lower strength or amplitude at this point. In this way, when we get two phase shifts at cross, we can make the decision as to whether or not it was 90 or 45 degrees by looking at the amplitude or power of the signal. This is a method where phase jitter can be overcome by adding a second modulation technique to the signal. This particular type of transmission is called QAM, or quadrature amplitude modulation. It combines phase shifting and amplitude changes to send the information. Now with the phase modulation technique, I can take and by increasing the complexity through combining amplitude and phase modulation, add more and more speed to the modem. Currently we have modems that operate at 9600 bits per second, full duplex on dial-up lines, and up to 19,200 bits per second on lease lines using techniques such as what is called lattice or trellis coding, which are even more advanced versions of QAM. What we're going to look at now, though, is the problem of timing that's involved with these modems. Because what we see is the phase shifts here must occur on time. If we cannot look at this phase and compare it to the next one and the next one on time, then the modem will not work properly. So as the modem is generating the phase shifts, it will send back to the computer the timing to tell it, give me the next bit. In the frequency shift modems, we didn't care because we were looking at the frequency of the signal. But here, since we're looking at the exact phase, we must have the bits on time from the computer, and we must change the phase on time. Therefore, the modem timing becomes very critical. In our phase modulated modems, there is a circuit called a clock circuit. This generates a clock which comes out on pin 15 for the transmitted data. The computer then, or terminal, uses this clock to time when to send the bits in on pin 2, which is transmitted data. The clock also tells the modulator 
when the phase shifts should occur. On the receive side, we look at the phase shifts coming in, and by the phase shifts, we recover the clock from the signal and give it out to the computer or terminal. And they use that then to know when to look at pin 3 receive data and pull off the individual bits or marks and spaces. So we generate the clock here, and then through the phase shifts on the receive side, we recover the clock since the phase shifts tell us when every two or three bits occurs depending on the modulation scheme. The modems that we looked at so far were all based around Western Electric type construction. Now in the United States typically our modems were always built to Western Electric standards for communications or modulation schemes. That was because before deregulation the majority of modems out there came from the Bell system and the Western Electric construction. If we look at Western Electric Company and we contrast them against the overseas standards of the CCITT, we see that the Western Electric 103 type modem had a comparable modem from the CCITT called the V21. They weren't exactly the same. The V21 only went up to 200 bits per second. The 202 type modem, which was that frequency shift modem that we saw went up to 1200 BPS, had a companion modem in the CCITT standard V23. The 212, now the 212 type modem is one that you see very popularly with personal computers and things. This is the 1200 bit per second full duplex modem used on dial-up lines. Typically the most popular one in the United States is the Hayes modem. The 212 has a European standard or CCITT standard of V22. A 212 and a V22 modem though will not communicate with each other. The type of modulation scheme used is enough different that they can't talk. But they're both the full duplex 1200 bit per second modem. What we've seen though now is there is no comparable Western Electric standard for 2400 bit per second full duplex. Even in the United States now we've adopted the standard called V22 BIS. As newer standards are coming out, such as V32, which is full duplex 9600 bit per second dial-up, the U.S. manufacturers are adopting the international standards and more and more are becoming compatible with the rest of the world. In your book is a more complete list of the U.S. and international standards you can refer to. Up until now in Section 3, all we've been concerned with is actually how information is encoded from digital format into something that will move across a telephone line or communication circuit and be encoded back into digital. We were just looking at ones and zeros or marks and spaces. We really didn't care what the interaction between the terminal and the computer was. Now we're going to move into that realm. We're going to look at what do the computer and the terminal say to each other and how do they talk to one another. For instance, on this terminal here, if I send some information up and it comes back to me, how did the mainframe receive that information, how did it know it was correct, and how did it send it back to me so it displayed on the screen? Protocols are what the computer and the terminal use to talk to each other so that they both understand what's going on. Now, so far, all we've talked about is the computer and the terminal or computer to computer communications at the physical level. The digital information being converted to tones and back again. Beyond this is the actual information passing across the telephone line. And protocols, which are what we're going to look at now, are how the information is passed. To begin our study of protocols, we're going to look at a simple type of communication circuit using a terminal in this particular terminal is what we call interactive or TTY terminal. In this case, every time the operator depresses a key, a character is sent down the communication circuit to the computer where the computer reads the character in and then it will echo it back so that it displays on the terminal again. This is a very simple type of communications protocol that we call TTY or teletype protocol. Later on, we're going to look at more complex type communication circuits 
where we have what are either called intelligent terminals or they're connected to a controller that talks to the computer with a very complex protocol. With the active or TTY type terminal, the information that you type in is usually typed in a single line, you hit a carriage return, and the computer responds to that input. So it operates in what we call a line-by-line -line mode. You don't usually get a fully formatted screen like you do on some computer systems. The data, as it's being typed in and echoed back from the computer, occurs as random characters being typed, with the time between the characters dependent on the typing skills and speed of the operator. Because the data occurs randomly, we use a special transmission method called asynchronous, where each character is going to carry its own timing and tell the computer when it begins and ends. This is a drawing out of your book that shows how a character looks when it goes down the line with asynchronous transmission. Normally, the telephone line is sitting in the marking condition, or what we would call all binary ones. Whenever the operator presses a key, in our particular case, eight bits of data would be sent down the line, representing the character code. Before the character goes down the line, they send one bit that is a space condition called a start bit. By sending this zero, or space first, it says this is the beginning of a character. And then the next eight times are marked off as the bits of the character in binary ones and zeros or marks in spaces. Following the character, the line always returns to a mark condition for at least one bit time called the stop bit. So that if two characters follow immediately behind one another, there will always be a mark here called the stop before you see the next start. So by telling the computer when the character begins with a start bit and when it ends, all of the timing for this character is contained within itself. This is what we call asynchronous transmission. It tells you when it begins and when it ends within each character. In our data transmission format within this course, we're going to work with the code called ASCII, A-S-C-I-I, which means American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Now there are other codes you'll run into when you work on data transmission equipment, such as the Baudot code, which is a 5-bit code, and the EBCDIC code, which is the Extended Binary Coded Decimal Interchange code, which is used a lot by the IBM Corporation. To try to keep this course simple, though, we only want to work with the ASCII code, which is an 8-bit code. We'll take a look at the ASCII chart and see how characters are assembled with this code. This is the copy of the chart out of your manual that shows the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. On this chart are arranged all the different characters which can be represented by this code. And you can see here is the uppercase alphabet, and across from it's the lowercase. And on the left side of the chart are what we call the control characters and format effectors. For instance, the code here which says CR is a carriage return. That's the code that's sent down the line when you hit the carriage return key on a terminal. Here's the backspace character which moves the cursor back one position, or the bell character which causes the terminal alarm or bell to sound. On the left side of the chart and on the top are the bits numbered as they would occur in the character when it was sent down the line. For instance, if you sent the character uppercase A, you would send down the line in sequence 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Now, if you count, there's only seven bits here. There is an eighth bit in the ASCII code, but it's used for what we call parity or redundancy checking. In order to describe how the parity bit works, or the last bit in this ASCII code, what happens is, if we were going to send some characters down the line, and if you look at your chart, you'll see that if this is bit 1 and this is bit 7, this is the character uppercase A, uppercase B, and uppercase C. What we do is decide on what type of parity we're going to use. In this case, we'll look at even parity. Now, in even parity, it says that if I go through and count all the marks in the character, or binary ones, 
and I don't include the start and stop bit in this, just the data, all of these should total up to an even number. For instance, if I count 1, 2, 2 is an even number, therefore I put a 0 as the last bit of the character. Same thing here. 1, 2 marks, I put a 0. With the character C, when I count them up, 1, 2, 3 marks, 3 is an odd number, so I add a 1, which makes it 4 marks, which is now an even number. So at the receiving side, the computer will add up the number of marks in each character. If they're not an even number, it will flag them as errors. If this was odd parity, we'd look for an odd number of marks. And then if it was what's called mark or space parity, it would have either a continuous mark or a continuous space condition in here. We've taken our asynchronous terminal here, and we've set it up so that it's connected to an oscilloscope and you can actually see the data coming out of the terminal and what the marks and spaces look like electrically. If I take and type characters here on the screen you'll see the character print but at the same time you can see the character going down the line. Now if we come in real close at this we can actually examine the marks and spaces or the bits that make up the character A when it's transmitted using the ASCII code. And if you look, the first thing you see is the line drops down low. That's the start bit. Then it comes up high, and that's the first bit of the character A, which if you look at your ASCII chart, you'll see is a 1 or a mark, followed by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 spaces or zeros, followed by a mark, followed by another zero, and ending up here with a stop bit. So you can actually look at all of the bits of the character on the line and understand that through a series of marks and spaces is how we determine what each character is. Here's the character S as sent down the line, and W. And you'll notice the bits are different to tell you which character it is.